I mostly read public domain books here on Glenn Reads Books to you, and they were written a long time ago, so they're usually racist or sexist or bigoted. But in there somewhere is a story, and uh, that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist. But they might have uh, adult language or adult situations, like, uh, oh, I don't know, making sex. Uh, so that's your warning. But I'm sure you're grown up enough to handle it. Uh, don't write to me complaining. The mice aren't even going in the traps anymore. They just eat the peanut butter and then escape without getting caught in the... Oh, God damn it. All right, fine. Why don't you take a little seat, you idiot? Uh, and welcome to the Glenn Reads Books to You mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording my basement that is overrun with mice that don't even get caught in the traps anymore. They just eat the peanut butter and sneak off. I don't know what to do anymore. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week... We're going to uh, keep reading The Legend of the Seventh Virgin by Victoria Holt. A book that's not bad, it's just long. When I started into it, I didn't realize it was 400 pages, which means every episode here in my mansion, not basement, that I record, uh, I try to keep it around like uh, 40 minutes or so, because otherwise it's just boring. Who wants to listen to one person read? for hours on end. But uh, here I am having to do a giant episode just to uh, get through this goddamn book. Uh, it's going to be long. I've decided I'm going to read 80 pages, uh, which is going to wind up being like two hours. Uh, you want to hear about the author? Uh, Eleanor Alice Hibbert, the real name of this author, was born September 1st, 1906 and died January 18th, 1993. Died right at the peak of of Nirvana, uh, was an English writer of historical romances, and she published several books uh, a year in different literary genres, each genre under a different pen name. Jean Pleady uh, for fictionalized history of European royalty, Victoria Holt for gothic romances, as we're reading now, and Philippa Carr for a multi-generational family saga, which sounds boring as hell. <clears throat> Want to hear some fun facts? Sure, we're just going to keep going through the history of gothic romances. Uh, the female gothic. From castles, dungeons, forests, and hidden passages of the gothic novel genre emerged the female gothic. Guided by the works of authors such as Anne Radcliffe, Mary Shelley, and Charlotte Bronte, uh, the female gothic allowed women's societal and sexual desires to be introduced. In many respects, the novel's intended reader was of the time uh, was a woman who, even as she enjoyed such novels, felt she had to lay down her book with affected indifference or momentary shame. According to Jane Austen, the gothic novel uh, shaped its form for women's readers to turn to gothic romances to find support for their own mixed feelings. Female gothic narratives focus on such topics as persecuted heroine fleeing from a villainous father and searching uh, for an absent mother. Uh, at the same time, male writers tend toward the masculine transgression of social taboos, and the emergence of ghost story gave women writers something to write about besides a common marriage plot, allowing them to present a more radical critique of the male power, violence, and predatory sexuality. When the female gothic coincides uh, with explained supernatural and natural cause of terror is not the supernatural, but female disability of societal horrors, uh, rape, incest, and threatening control of a male antagonist, female gothic novels also address women's discontent with patriarchal society, their difficult and unsatisfying uh, maternal position, and their role within that society. Well, there you go. With that, why don't we scooch on down to the library where we can snuggle up and uh, continue reading this book for two hours. Well, there you go. Why don't you get yourself settled in? Uh, did you bring a book? You actually brought a book. All right. <clears throat> uh, why shouldn't daughters do as well as sons? Uh, because they don't have the same name. Uh, when they marry, they belong to a different family and the line is lost. Well, Meliora was thoughtful. Then she said, uh, uh, the Martins will die with me. Think of that. At least the uh, Carlys have your brother. Uh, the one who's hurt his leg falling off a tree. Because we had become so close now, I knew I could trust her, and I told her the truth of that incident. 
and she listened intently. Then she said, well, I, I, I'm glad you saved him, and I'm, uh, I'm glad Kim helped. You'll not tell anyone? No, of course not. Uh, but no one could do so much about it now, in any case. Uh, isn't it strange, Karen, sir, that we live here, burp, in this quiet country place, and tremendous things happen around us, just as though we lived in a big city? Uh, perhaps more so. Oh, just think of the Darrises. I never heard of them until this day. Oh, I never heard the story? Well, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, actually, this book that I got off of Kindle, which is apparently just been scanned and then put into a big giant word document. Uh, it doesn't say I'll tell you. It says F you tell you. Ugh. I can't believe I bought this off of Amazon. Just this horseshit, badly transcribed things with anyways, 200 years ago, one of the Darrises gave birth to a monster. Oh, oh, it's quite frightful. Uh, they shut it up in a secret room and hired a strong man to look after it. And, uh, Pretended to the world that the baby had been uh, born dead. And of course, this book being transcribed horribly for being scanned in says bomb dead. They smuggled a dead baby into the house uh, and it was buried in the Darris' vault. Meanwhile, the monster lived on. Oh, oh, they were terrified of it because it was not only malformed, but evil. Someone said that the devil had been its mother's lover. And they had other sons and in them. In time, one of these married and, and brought his new bride to the house. And on Wednesday, wedding evening night, oh, they played hide-and-seek, and the bride went away to hide. Yeah, I can see where this is going. Oh, it was Christmas time, and the jailer wanted to join in the wassailing. I imagine that's probably a badly transcribed thing, but uh, W-A-S-S-A-L-I-N-G. Is that a real word? Let's look it up. I don't think it is. I think it's just been badly. Uh, wassail. Oh, spiced ale or mulled wine? drunk during celebrations to drink plentiful to go from house to house on Christmas seeing carols apparently it's a real word uh, so he drank so much uh, that he uh, went to a drunken sleep but he had left the key in the door of the monster's room when the new bride who didn't know the, the, the house and that no one had ever went into the wing which uh, she is said to be haunted because the monster made queer noises at night uh, saw the key in the lock oh she turned it and the monster sprang at her uh, he didn't hurt her uh, because uh, she was so fair and lovely. But she was shutting at them, and she screamed and screamed so that uh, those who were searching for her knew uh, where she was. Well, that's convenient. Her husband, guessing what had happened, snatched up a gun, burst into the room, shot the monster dead. But uh, the bride went mad, and the monster, as he died, cursed all the Darrises and said that, that what had happened to the young bride will reoccur every now and then in that family. Oh, I listened spellbound to the story. And the present lady, Darius, is half crazy, they say. Ah, she comes out of the moor when the moon is full and dances round the tour. Ah, she has a, a companion who's a, a sort of keeper. Ah, that's true enough. And it's the curse. Ow! Oh, oh, they're all doomed. I tell you, so you shouldn't envy them, their fine house and riches. But the uh, curse will die out now because this will be the end of the line. There's only Judith. Now the daughter of the lady who dances around the tour at the full moon. Meliora nodded. Uh, do you believe the story of the virgins? I asked. Meliora hesitated. Uh, uh, well, she said, when I stand there amongst those stones, they seem alive to me. Yeah, me too. One night, Karen, sir, when there's a full moon, we'll go down and look at them. I've always wanted to be there at the full moon. Uh, do you think there's something special about moonlight? Oh, oh, of course. The ancient Britons worshipped the sun. And the moon, I expect. Uh, they made sacrifices, things. Uh, that day when I saw you standing in the wall, I thought you, you were the seventh virgin. Now, I guess you did. Uh, you look so odd, just the way you would look if you saw a ghost. And that night, went on Meliora, I dreamt that you were being walled up in the abyss. And I pulled away the stones till my hands were bleeding. And I helped you escape, Karen, sir. Uh, but I got terribly hurt during it. As uh, she went on her back, uh, the view to spread out before us. It, it, it's time we went home, she said. <clears throat> At first... Uh, we were very solemn as we rode back, and then we both seemed to become obsessed with the desire to break the mood which had sedated us. Meliora said that nowhere in the world were there so many legends as in Cornwall. Why should there be, I asked. Uh, because uh, there's sort of people, uh, things like that happen to, I suppose. 
Then the frivolous mood came to us, and we started telling wild stories about the stones, huh? and the boulders, which had passed, uh, each trying to cap each other's story and becoming more and more ridiculous. But neither of us was really attending to what we said. I believe Meliora was thinking of that dream of hers, and so was I. The time began to pass quickly because each day was like another. Oh, I had settled into my comfortable routine, and, and whenever I went to the cottage to see Granny, I told her that being almost a lady was as wonderful as I had always thought it would be. She said that uh, it was because I was so constantly striving to reach a goal, uh, which is a good way to live, providing that it was a good goal. Uh, she herself was doing well, better than ever before, and uh, could have lived well enough on the good things I brought her from the parsonage kitchens and what Joe brought her from the vet's house. Only yesterday, the Pengasters had killed a pig, and Hetty had seen to it that the fair-sized ham had come her way. Oh, she had salted it down. Oh, and there's meal for many a day to come. Her reputation had never been so fine. Joe was happy in his work. The vet thought highly of him. Now and then, he gave him a penny or two, yeah, when he had done some kind of job, done well. Uh, and Joe said that he had lived with the family and treated as a member of it. Uh, but he wouldn't have minded how they treated him as long as he could be looking after his animals. It's, uh, it's strange how it turned out so well, I said. Well, like summer before a bad winter, agreed Granny. I have to remember, though, lovey, that winter can and will come again. Tain't natural to have summer all the time. Uh, but I believed uh, that I was going to live in perpetual summer. Uh, only a few trivial matters darkened my pleasant existence. One was when I saw Joe riding through the village with the vet on his way to the Avis stables. Now he's, he's standing at the back of the trap, and I felt it was an indignity for my brother to ride like a servant. And I should have liked to see him riding like a friend of the vet's or an assistant. Uh, better still, if he could have ridden in the doctor's broham. I still hate those occasions when Meliora went uh, ass assisting, uh, lasting. It's another screw-up in the book. It just has the uh, uh, the slash with asting <laughs> in her best gown and long white gloves. I wanted to be beside her, learning how to enter a drawing room, how to make light uh, conversation, but of course no one invited me. But then again, Mrs. Yeo would let me know how, and uh, then, not for all Miss Kelly's friendly, or Meliora's friendliness, uh, that I was only a, a superior servant in the house, on the level with her enemy, Miss Kello. Almost, but not quite that. These were small pinpricks in my idyllic life. And when Meliora and I sewed our samplers, names and dates and the tiniest cross stitches, uh, which were a trial to me, Miss Kello allowed us to work in our Awa motto. Uh, and for mine, I chose, uh, life is yours as you will make it. And because it was my creed, I enjoyed every stitch. Meliora chose hers, uh, do unto others, they do unto you, because she said that if you follow that, you must be a good friend to everyone, since you were uh, everyone's best friend. I often remember that summer, sitting by the open window, as we worked out our lessons, or sometimes under a chestnut tree in the levee while, while we stitched at our samplers and, and talked together to the background music of contented bees and sweet-scented lavender. The garden was full of good smells. Oh, various flowers, the pine trees, the warm, damp earth mingled with, with uh, occasional odors from the, uh, from the kitchen, white butterflies. Nah, there was a plague of them that summer, danced madly about the hanging purple of the bedalias, and I would sometimes try to catch at a moment and whisper to myself, Now, this is now. I wanted to keep it forever. But uh, time was always there to defeat me, passing, inexorably passing. Even as I spoke that now, it had become the past. Beyond the hedge, I was aware of the graveyard with its tombstones. A constant reminder that time will stand still for none of us, but I always contrived to turn my back on it uh, for how I wanted that summer to go on. Uh, perhaps it was some intuition on my part for that summer uh, saw the end of life in which I found a comfortable niche for myself. The year before, Justin St. Lambden left the university and we uh, saw more of him. Oh, offer I'd uh, often I would encounter him riding through the village. It, it was his duty now to help with the estate in readiness for the day when he would become the squire. If Meliora was with me, 
He would bow courteously, oh, and even smile. But his was a rather melancholy smile. When we met him, oh, that made Meliora's day. She would become prettier and quieter, as though occupied with pleasant thoughts. Oh, Kim, who was a, a little younger than Justin, was still at the university, and I thought with pleasure of the days when he would have finished. And then perhaps uh, we should see him more often in the village. One afternoon, we were sitting on the lawn with our samplers in our hands, and I had finished my motto when he had come to the full stop after, well, uh, when Bess ran out on the lawn. Oh, she came straight over to us and Miss, there'd be terrible news from the, uh, from the abbess. Meliora turned uh, quite pale and dropped her needlework onto the grass. What news? She demanded. Oh, oh, and I knew that she was thinking something terrible had happened to Justin. Uh, Tis Sir Justin. He have collapsed uh, in his study, uh, they do say. Doctor's been with him. Oh, he'd be terrible bad, not expected to live, uh, they do say. Mariola uh, relaxed visibly. Uh, Who says so? Uh, Well, uh, Mr. Belter... Uh, he did have it from his head of groom up there, and he said he'd be in a terrible state. When Bess went in, we continued to sit on the lawn, but we could no longer work. I knew that Meliora was thinking of uh, what this would mean to Justin, and she would uh, be to Sir Justin if his father died, the abbess would belong to him. I wondered if, if she was sad because uh, she didn't like to hear of illness, or, or perhaps Justin seemed to be more out of reach than ever. It was Miss Kello who uh, had the next news first. Oh, she read the announcements each morning because, as she implied, there was interested uh, to hear of the births and deaths and marriages in illustrious families that served. As she came into the schoolroom, paper in hand, Meliora looked at me and made a little grimace. Uh, which Miss Kello couldn't see. It had been, uh, now uh, we shall hear that Sir Somebody has been getting married or has died, or that he, uh, he was treated as one of the family uh, who then served them, and how different for her life was then that she had sunk to become a governess in the impunctious manage of a country parson. <clears throat> I don't know why that sentence was so hard to read. There's uh, some interesting news in the paper, she said. Ow, oh, Meliora always displayed interest. Poor Kelly. Oh, she had uh, to me often. She doesn't get much fun out of life. Let her enjoy her honorables and nobles. Well, uh, uh, there uh, be a wedding at the Abbas. Oh, Meliora didn't speak. Tess, uh, Miss Keller went on in a manly slow way of hers, which meant that she wanted to keep us in suspense as long as possible. Uh, Justin St. Lamston is, in, uh, is engaged to be married. Well, I didn't know if I could ever feel someone else's distress so keenly. After all, uh, it was nothing uh, to me uh, who Justin St. Lamston married. Oh, oh my poor, poor Meliora, uh, who had her dreams. Even from this, I could learn a lesson. Uh, it was folly to dream unless you did something about making that dream come true. And what had Meliora ever done? Uh, just smiled prettily at him when they passed dressed with special care when uh, she was invited to tea at the abbess, exclamation point, uh, when all this time he had looked upon her as a child. Uh, who's he going to marry? asked Meliora, speaking very distinctly. Well, it seems odd that it should be announced just now, said Miss Kello, still eager to, de- to delay the announcement, uh, with Sir Justin so ill and uh, ooh, likely to die at any moment, but uh, perhaps it is just the reason. Who? repeated Meliora. Miss Kello couldn't hold it back any longer. Miss Judith Therese, she said. Sir Justin didn't die, but he was paralyzed. We never saw him riding again to the hunt or striding to the woods, his gun over his shoulder. Dr. Hillard was with him twice a day, and the question most asked in St. Lamson was, Heard how he's he's doing? Heard how he's doing today? (laughs) I love how I couldn't read that, but I played it off pretty well. Uh, We were all expecting him to die, but he lived on. And then we accepted the fact that he wasn't going to die uh, just yet, although he was paralyzed and couldn't walk. This is kind of terrible. Uh, after he had heard the news, Meliora went to the, uh, into the room and it wouldn't see anyone, not even me. Ow, ow, she had a headache, she said, and she wanted to be alone. <laughs> and when I did go in, she was very composed, though pale. All she said was, ah, it's uh, that Judith DeReese. Uh, she's uh, she's one of the doom. She'll bring doom to St. Lampston. It's uh, it's that I mind. Then I thought she couldn't have cared uh, for him seriously. He was just the center of a childish dream. 
and I had imagined that her feelings for him were as intense as mine were for rising out of that station which I had been born. Which, again, the way this book is uh, formatted, it says bomb. Uh, oh, it couldn't be so. Otherwise, it would have cared as much uh, whoever had had arranged to marry. And that's how I thought, and it seemed sensible enough to me. There was no reason why the wedding should be delayed, and six weeks after we saw the announcement, ah, it took place. Some of the St. Lampson people went over to Doris's church uh, to the wedding. Meliora was on the edge, wondering whether she and her father would have an invitation. But she need not have worried. There was none. On the day of her wedding, we sat in the garden together. Oh, we were very solemn. It was rather like waiting for someone to be executed. Uh, we heard news through the servants, and it occurred to me that a good system of espionage we had. Oh, the servants from the parsonage, those from the abbess, uh, and from the Dries Manor, formed a, a ring of news and was passed on and circulated. The bride had a magnificent gown of lace and satin, and her veil and orange blossom had been worn by numerous Doris brides. That's, you're just cursing yourself. And I wondered if, 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 if the one who had seen the monster had gone mad and worn the veil. I mentioned this to Meliora. Oh, she wasn't a Doris, Meliora pointed out. She was a stranger, and that's why she didn't know where the monster was kept. Yeah, we already got that premise. Uh, have you met Judith? I asked. I, uh, uh, only once. She was at the Abbess, and it was uh, one of Lady St. Lampson's at home. Uh, she's very tall, uh, slender, and uh, beautiful, with dark hair, and, and big dark eyes. Hey, at least she's beautiful, and I suppose the St. Lampson's will be richer now, won't they? Uh, she'll have a dowry. Meliora turned to me, and she was angry. Uh, which was rare with her. Uh, she took me by the shoulders, and she shook me. I uh, st uh, Stop talking about riches. Stop thinking about it. Uh, isn't there anything else in the world? I tell you, I'll bring doom on the abbess. She's doomed. Oh, they all are. Well, it can't matter to us. Her dark eyes with uh, something like a fury. Oh, they are our neighbors. Of course it matters. I, I can't see how. Uh, they don't care about us. Why should we care about them? They're my friends. Uh, friends? Uh, they don't bother much about you. They don't even ask you to the wedding. I didn't want to go to this wedding. Uh, doesn't make it any better for not asking you. Oh, stop it, Karen, sir. It won't even be the same. I'll tell you, nothing will ever be the same. It's changed. Can you feel it? Yes, I can feel it. Uh, it was not so much changed as changing. Uh, and the reason was that uh, we weren't children anymore. Meliora would soon be 17. And I should be a few months after. And we should put up our hair and be young ladies. But we were growing up. Uh, we were already thinking with nostalgia of the long, sunny days of childhood. Sir Justin's wife, life, not wife, life, was no longer in danger, and his elder son had brought a bride to the abbess. This was a time for rejoicing, and the St. Lampsons had decided to give a ball. It would take place before... Uh, she uh, probably wasn't invited to that either. <clears throat> it would probably take place before the summer was over, and it hoped there would be a warm night so that the guests could enjoy the beauty of the grounds, as well as the splendors of the house. Invitations were issued, and there was one for Meliora. Oh, and her father. The bride and groom had gone to Italy for their honeymoon, and the ball was to celebrate their return. It was uh, to be a mass ball and a very grand affair. We had heard that it was uh, the wish of Sir Justin, who would not himself be able to join in, that the ball should take place. Well, I was quite sure how Meliora felt about the invitation. She should be happy. She was invited to the wedding. At least she could go to this party. Uh, she seemed to be to uh, veer between excitement and melancholy. She was changing as she grew up, and uh, she had once been so serene. I was envious and couldn't hide it. Oh, oh, oh I wish I could, could come, Karen, Karen, sir, she said. Oh, how I should love to see you there. That old house means something to you, doesn't it? Uh, Tess, I said, a uh, sort of symbol. Uh, she nodded. It often happened that our minds were in tune, and I didn't have to explain to her. Uh, she went about with a thoughtful frown some days, and when I mentioned the ball, she shrugged the subject aside uh, impatiently. Uh, about four days after she had received the invitation, she came out of her father's study looking grave. Pop is not well, she said. I've known he hasn't been for some time. Well, I'd known it, too. His skin seemed to be getting more yellow every day. Uh, he says, she went on, that he can't go to the ball. 
I have been wondering what sort of costume he would have worn because it is difficult to imagine him looking anything like a, uh, but like a, but like a parson. Uh, does this mean you won't go? I can't very well go alone. Oh, dot, 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 Meliora. She shrugged impatiently. And that afternoon, she went out with Miss Kello in a pony trap. And I heard the trap from my window. <clears throat> and when I looked out, I saw them. And I, I felt hurt because she hadn't asked me to go with them. When she came back, she burst into my room, her eyes sparkling, her cheeks slightly flushed. Uh, she sat on my bed and started to bounce up and down. Then she stopped and, putting her head on one side, said, Cinderella, would you like to go to the ball? Meliora, I gasped. You mean dot, dot, dot. She nodded. You're invited. Well, not you exactly, because... Uh, she has the faintest notion, but I have an invitation for you, and it's gonna be such fun, Karen, huh? Oh, much more than going with Papa or some chaperone. Yeah, Papa with his gross yellow skin. Oh, you better found for me. Uh, how'd you manage it? Oh, well, this afternoon I called on Lady St. Lamston, and it happens to be her at-home day. Oh, that gave me an opportunity of speaking to her, so I told her Papa was unwell with his gross yellow skin and unable to bring me to the ball. Burp. But I had a friend staying with me. Oh, so his invitation could be transferred to her. And she was very gracious. Meliora. But she knows. Oh, she won't. I changed your name just in case that she might know you. Uh, I got the impression uh, that you were... Uh, she got the impression that you were my aunt. Although I didn't say so. It's a masked ball. Uh, she'll receive us at the staircase. And you'll have to try, try to look of sober years. Yeah, you know, old enough to take a lady to the ball. I'm so excited about it now. Carrots. Uh, oh, oh, we'll have to decide what we're going to wear. Costumes. Just imagine it. Everyone will look glorious, by the way. You'll be Mrs. Carling, Carleon. Carleon. All right, whatever. Miss Carleon, I am murmured. Then, uh, how can I get a costume? Now she put her head on one side. You should have worked harder with your needlework. Uh, you see, Papa's worried about money, so he can't give me much to buy a gown, so we'll have to find uh, two of our own. Uh, how do I go without a gown? Oh, don't be so easily defeated. Uh, life is yours to make it as you will. Uh, what about that? Uh, and here, you are saying you can't, can't, can't. The first obstacle. She put her arms around me, and suddenly she clung to me. It's fun having a sister. Ugh. That's so gross. Just because she had the same name as a sister that died. And she said, uh, what was that your old granny said about sharing things? And then, uh, if you shared your joys, you doubled them. Uh, if you shared your sorrows, you halved them. Well, that's true. Now that you're coming, I'm so excited. She pushed me away from her and sat down on the bed again. First thing to do is to decide what costumes we should like to wear. And then we'll see how near we can get to them. Picture yourself looking like one of those paintings in the gallery at the Abbas. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen them. Velvet, I think. You would make a fine Spaniard with your dark hair piled up high on a comb and a mantella. Well, it's exciting now, I said. I have Spanish blood. My grandfather. Uh, uh, Spanish. Uh, I could get the comb and the mantilla. Well, there, you see, red velvet, I think, uh, for you. My mama had a red velvet evening gown. Uh, her things hadn't been touched. Uh, she was up again, taking my hands and twirling me around. The masks are easy. You cut them out of black velvet. Everything is velvet with this person. This is a weird kid. And we do patterns on them with beads. Oh, uh, we've got three weeks to get ready. Well, uh, I was far more excited than she that's true. My invitation was a little oblique, and I would never have been given uh, had Lady St. Lampson known who was receiving it. I kind of forgot why Lady St. Lampson hates her so much. Uh, Christ, it's been a few weeks. I don't remember why that's the deal. So apparently she's hiding her identity. But still, I was going, and I was going to wear a red velvet dress, which had seen and tried on. I, I had to be altered and reshaped, but uh, we could do it. Miss Kello helped. Not very graciously, but she was an expert needlewoman. I was pleased because my costume was costing nothing. And the money, not very much, which Reverend Charles had given Meliora, could be uh, all spent on her. Oh, we decided that her costume should be a Grecian, and so that we wore white, white velvet, gold-colored silk, in which we sewed gold sequins. Oh, it was a loose-fitting 
governed, caught in by gold, and with her hair falling about her shoulders and a black velvet mask, again with the velvet, uh, she looked beautiful, as you do with velvet. And as the days passed, we talked of nothing but the ball and Sir Justin's health. Uh, we were terrified that he would die and the ball would have to be canceled. I went to tell Granny B about it. I'm going as a Spanish lady, I told her. It's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. Well, she looked at me a little sadly, and then she said, uh, don't count uh, too much from it, lovey. I'm not counting on anything, I said. I'm just reminding myself that I should go to the abbess as a guest, and I shall uh, be dressed in red velvet. Yeah, Granny, you should see the dress I'm to wear. Uh, Parson's daughter, uh, have been good to you, lovey. Uh, be your friend always. Uh, of course I shall. Uh, she's as glad to have me uh, to go with her as I am to go. Miss Kello thinks I shouldn't be going, though. That is to be hoped that she don't find some way of telling Lady St. Lampston who you be. What am I forgetting? God dang it, do I have to go back and listen to my own episodes? I don't do that. I don't want to sit around listening to my own voice reading. I forgot why the St. Lampstons hate her so much. I shook my head triumphantly. Mad she shouldn't dare. Granny went to the storehouse, and I followed and watched while she opened a box and took out two combs and mentellas. Now, I like to put mine on some night, she said. Uh, then, when I'm here alone, I fancy Pedro's with me. Gross. And for that, uh, how he'd like to see me. Come, let me try this on you. Lightly, she held up my hair and stuck the comb in the back. Oh, it's a tall comb, set uh, with brilliance. Oh, you look just as I did at your age, lovey. Now the mantella. She draped it about my head and stood back. Ah, oh, when it's done as it should be, there won't be uh, one of them to touch you, she declared. I'd like to dress your hair myself, granddaughter. It was the first time she'd dressed me thus, and I would sense her pride in me. Come to the parsonage on the night, Granny, I said, and then you can see my room and uh, dress my hair for me. Eh, uh, would it be allowed? Well, I narrowed my eyes. I'm not a servant there. Uh, not really. Only you can dress my hair, so you must. She laid her hand on my arm and smiled at me. Take care, Karen says, she said. Always take care. An invitation had arrived for me, and it was that Sir Justin and Lady Lampson requested the pleasure of Miss Carlington at the costume ball. Meliora and I were almost hysterical with laughter when we read it. And Meliora kept calling me Miss Carlington in imitation of St. Lampson's voice. Oh, there was no time to lose. When our dresses were finished, we tried them on every day, and I practiced wearing the comb and the mantella, and we sat together making our masks, show, uh, sewing uh, tiny black bugle beads on them so they glittered. Those days were some of the happiest days of my life. We practiced dancing. Oh, it was easy when you're young and light on your feet. Meliora said, you simply followed your partner and I discovered that I could dance well and I loved it. During those days, we did not notice that the Reverend Charles was growing more and more wan every day. Wan meaning yellowy skin. He spent a great deal of his time in his study, and he knew how excited we were, and I think, although this didn't occur to me until afterwards, uh, that he didn't want to cast the slightest shadow over our pleasure. At last, the day of the ball arrived. Meliora and I dressed in our costumes, and Granny came out to the parsonage to do my hair. Oh, she brushed it. Uh, put on some of her special concoction on it so, they, so it gleamed and shone. And then came the comb and the mantella. Meliora clasped her, uh, clasped her hand in admiration when she saw the effect. Everyone will notice Miss Carlington, she said. Nah, it looks like uh, it looks well here in the bedroom, I reminded her, but uh, think of all the lovely costumes those rich people will be wearing. Diamonds eh, and rubies. And all you have to do, uh, all you have is your youth, said Granny, and she laughed. Reckon some of them will be willing to barter their diamonds and rubies for that. Carrots looks different pointed out Meliora, and uh, although they all look their best, no one will look quite like her. We put on our masks and stood side by side, giggling as we studied our reflections. Now, said Meliora, we look quite mysterious. Granny went home, and Miss Kello drove us to the abbess. The trap looked incongruous and among all the fine carriages, but that only amused us. As for me, I was approaching the culmination of a dream. I was overwhelmed as I stepped in the hall. I tried to see everything at once and consequently had nothing more than a hazy impression. A chandelier with what seemed like hundreds of candles, walls hung with tapestry, 
pots and flowers, the scent of which filled the air. People uh, everywhere, and uh, it was like straying into one of those foreign courts which I had read about in history lessons. Many of the ladies' dresses were 14th century Italian, I learned afterward, and after several of them wore their hair caught in the jeweled snoods. I'm going to look up what snoods means. Uh, it's an ornament, hairnet, or fabric bag worn over the back of the hair. I know what they're talking about. Who cares? Brocades, brocades, velvets, silks, and satins. Oh, it was a glorious assembly. And what made it all the more exciting were the masks that we're all wearing. Oh, I was thankful for them, and I could feel more like one of them uh, than when uh, there was no danger of being discovered. We were to unmask at midnight. But uh, by then, the ball would be over, and Cinderella-like condition would cease to worry me. Uh, a wide and beautiful staircase was at one end of the hall, and we followed the crowd up there to where Lady St. Lamston, her mask in hand, was receiving her guests. We stood in a long, lofty room on either side of which were portraits of the St. Lamsons. Are we, is she going to get discovered? And I can finally figure out why the Lamsons hate her so much. Painted in their gorgeous silks and velvets. Uh, they might have been members of the party. There were evergreen plants about the room and gilded chairs, such as I had never seen before, and I, I wanted to examine everything closely. I was conscious of Meliora beside me. She was very simply clad compared <clears throat> with most of the women, but I thought she was more lovely than any of the others. With her golden hair and the gold about her slim waist, a man in green velvet doublet and a long green hose, just carrying green hose, uh, came toward us. Tell me if I'm wrong, he said, but I believe I've guessed. It's the golden locks. Oh, I knew that voice to be Kim's. Why is he holding a hose? Although I couldn't have uh, recognized him in that costume. He looked beautiful, he went on. And so does the Spanish lady. Kim, you shouldn't have guessed so soon, complained Meliora. No, I should have pretended to be puzzled. I thought uh, I should have uh, asked lots of questions. And then uh, just before the stroke of midnight, guessed. At least, said Meliora, you've only guessed me. Burp. He had turned to me and I saw his eyes through the mask. Then I could guess how they looked, laughing with the wrinkles and burp around them. They almost disappeared when he laughed. I confessed myself baffled. Meliora sighed with relief. I thought you would be here with your father, he went on. Uh, he's now well enough to come. Yeah, he's got that yellow skin. Hmm, sorry. Uh, but uh, glad it didn't prevent your appearing. Uh, thanks to my chaperone. Oh, so the Spanish lady's your chaperone? He pretended to peer behind my mask. Uh, seems too young for the role. I don't talk about it as though she's not here. Uh, she won't like that. Am I so eager to win her approval? Does she speak only Spanish? No, she speaks English. But she hasn't spoken any yet. Perhaps she only speaks when she has something to say. Oh, oh, Meliora, are you reproaching me? Lady of Spain, he went on, addressing me. I trust my presence does not offend you. Yeah, it doesn't offend me. I breathe again. May I conduct you two young ladies to the buffet? Well, that'd be pleasant, I said, speaking slowly and guardedly, because I was afraid now uh, that I was here among the people whom I had always longed to mix, uh, that I might, by some inflection of voice, some trace of accent or intonation, betray my origins. Uh, come then, Kim stood between us, gripping our elbows, and piloted us through the crowd. Well, we sat at one of the tables uh, by the dais, uh, which large tables laden with food had been set up. Well, I'd never been so much food in my life. Uh, pies and pastries being the main dish of the rich and the poor alike. Oh, there were more of these than anything else. But what pies and pastries? Oh, the pastry was a rich golden brown. Uh, some of the pies had been made to uh, fantastic shapes. Oh, that's cool. In the center of which was uh, a model of the abbess. Oh, that's really cool. Can you eat the abbess? Uh... There were the battlemented towers and the arched doorway. Uh, people were looking at it and expressing their admiration. On the pies, uh, figures of animals have been decorated to show uh, what they contain. Sheep for the muggity, lamby pies, uh, pig for natlins, tiny piglets for tattage. <sighs> natlins and tattage, muggity. I hate all these words. It's just, 
<laughs> England uh, to show that the pigs were stillborn. Uh, a bird for squab, again, curl you, fine. Uh, there were great dishes of clotted cream uh, for the gentry who could get it, always took cream with their pies. There were meats of all sorts, slices of beef and ham. Oh, there were pilchards served in various ways in pies, uh, which had been called fair maids, and uh, which Pedro had told Granny were really Cornish uh, way of pronouncing uh, Oh, they screwed up the word. I have no idea. Jafamundo? Uh, this is the transcribing of the book again. The letter J, Famundo. Whatever. Pilchard served with oil and lemon called by the Spaniards. Food fit for the grandest Spanish don. Well, there was all kinds of drinks, stirrup cup, which we had called Dash and Doris. Uh, there was methaglin and mead, gin, and other wines which came from foreign parts. Oh, it was amusing to see Haggerty in charge of those, bowing up secretly, looking very different from the self-important butler who had, uh, had wanted to hire me at Trinklet Fair. When I thought of what he would say, oh, if he knew what he would now have to serve a girl that he might have hired, I wanted to burst out laughing. When you're young and have known hunger, oh, you've always eat with relish. Wow, however excited you might be. And I did justice to the lamby pie and the fair maids which Kim brought us while he sipped the mead and poured by Haggerty. I had never tasted it before, and I liked the flavor of honey. Uh, but I always knew it was intoxicating, and I had no intention of dulling my senses on uh, the most exciting evening of my life. Kim watched us eat with pleasure, and I knew he was puzzled about me. I sensed he recognized uh, that he had met me before and was wondering where. I was delighted to keep him guessing. Look, he said, as we sipped our mead. Here comes Borgia boy. I looked and I saw him. Now he's dressed in black velvet. Everyone loves velvet. Oh, there was a, a something cap. It's all gobbledygook, thanks to this book. On his head and false mustaches. He looked at Meliora and then me. His gaze stayed on me. He bowed and said in a theatrical manner, Abma thinks I have met the fair Grecian in our St. Lampston lanes. <laughs> I knew at once that that was Johnny St. Lampston because I recognized his voice and I, as I had Kim's. Uh, but I am certain I have never seen the Spanish beauty before. <laughs> you should never be so sure of anything, said Meliora. If I had seen her once, I should have never forgotten her. And now her image will remain with me all the days of my life. It's strange, said Meliora, that by merely wearing a mask, you can't really hide your identity. The voice and gestures betray, said Kim. Uh, the three of us went to know each other, went on Johnny. Uh, that makes me mighty curious about the stranger in our midst. <laughs> and they drew his chair close to mine, and I began to feel uneasy. Your friend, Mariola, Mariola's, <clears throat> Meliora's, he added. I know your name. You're Miss Carlton. Carleon. Oh, you're not supposed to embarrass your guests, Meliora told him primarily. My dear Meliora, the whole purpose of a masked ball is to guess the identity of your companions before the unmasking. Uh, did, did you not know, Miss Carleon? Carleon? My mother told me that Meliora was bringing a friend as her father could not come. A chaperone. An aunt, I think. That uh, was what my mother had said. Surely you are not Meliora's aunt. I refuse to tell you who I am, I answered. You must wait for the unmasking. Now, as long as I may be at your side at that exciting moment, I can wait. The music had started, and a tall, handsome couple were opening the ball. I knew the man in Regency costume was Justin, and I guessed the tall, slim, dark-haired woman to be his uh, newly married wife. And I could not take my eyes from Judas St. Lampson, who, until recently, had been Judith Derice. She was wearing a crimson velvet dress, very similar in color to mine. But how much richer was hers? Oh, her neck diamonds glittered. Oh, they were also in her ears and her long slender fingers. Uh, her, her dark hair was worn in a pompadour fashion, which made her look uh, slightly taller than Justin. Well, you make everything on her sound really long and weird and slender. Who was very tall. She looked very attractive, but what I noticed more than anything was a certain nervous tension about her. Oh, it was betrayed by the sudden movements of her, of her head... And her hands. And I noticed, too, how she clung to Justin's hand. And even in the dance, she gave the impression that she was determined never to let him go. Oh, oh, how attractive she is, I said. Yeah, my new sister-in-law, murmured Johnny, his eyes following her. Oh, 
A handsome pair, I said. Well, my brother's the handsome member of the family, uh, don't you think? Oh, it's difficult to say until the unmasking takes place. Oh, well, that unmasking. Then I shall ask for your verdict. But by that time, I hope to approve to you that Justin's brother uh, has other qualities to make up for his lack of personal beauty. Uh, shall we dance? I was alarmed, uh, afraid that if I danced with Johnny St. Lamston, I should betray that I have never danced with a man before. If it had been Kim, I should have been less afraid, because I had already proved uh, that in an emergency, uh, one could rely on him. I was unsure about Johnny, but Kim was already leading Meliora out. Johnny took my hand and pressed it warmly. Spanish lady, he said, you're not afraid of me? And I gave the kind of laugh I might have given ah, years ago. Then I said in my slow, careful way, I see no reason to be. That's a good start. The musicians who were in a gallery at one end of the ballroom, were playing a waltz. I thought of waltzing around the uh, bedroom with Meliora. And, ugh, God, I'm really burping it up right now. And I hoped that my dancing would not betray my lack of experience, but it was easier than I thought. I was skillful enough not to arouse suspicion. How well our steps fit, said Johnny. I lost Meliora in the dance and wondered whether Johnny had intended that I should. And when we sat together on the gilded chairs, and when I was asked to dance by somebody else, I was rather relieved to, es uh, to escape from Johnny. We talked, or rather my partner did, of uh, other balls, of the hunt, of the changing conditions of the country. Oh, and I listened, careful never to betray myself. I learned that night that a, that a girl who listens and agrees quickly becomes popular. Oh, that's a sad thing to reflect on. But it was uh, not a role I intended to play permanently. Then I was taken back to my chair where Johnny was impatiently waiting. Meliora and Kim joined us and I danced with Kim. I enjoyed that very much. Although it wasn't so easy as it had been with Johnny, I suppose because Johnny was a better dancer. And all the time I kept thinking, ah, you're actually here in the Abyss. You, Curious and Carly, uh, Carly on for the night. We had more food and wine, and I didn't want the evening ever to end. I knew I should hate to take off my red velvet dress and let my hair down. I stored up in my mind every little incident so that I could tell Mariola the next day. And I joined the cotillion. Some of my partners were paternal, others flirtatious. I managed them with all of what I thought was great skill, and I asked myself why I had ever been so nervous. I drank a little of the dash and daris, uh, which Johnny and Kim had brought to our table with the food. Meliora was a little subdued. I believed she was hoping that she might dance with Justin. And I was dancing with Johnny. And then he said, oh, it's so crowded here. Let's go outside. Oh, and I followed him down the staircase and out to the lawns where some of the guests were dancing. Uh, it's an enchanting sight. Uh, the music could uh, heard distinctly through the open windows and the dresses of the men and the women looked fantastic in the moonlight. Oh, we danced over the lawn. We came to the hedge which separated the abbess lawns from the field in which stood the six virgins and the old mime. Uh, where, uh, where, you, where are you taking me? I asked. And uh, see the virgins. Now, I always wanted to see them in the moonlight, I said. Oh, a slow smile touched his lips, and I realized at once that I had given him a clue that I was not a stranger to the St. Lamstons, who had come for the ball, since uh, I knew of the existence of the virgins. Well, he whispered, so you shall. He took my hand, and together we ran over the grass. Oh, I leaned against one of the stones, and he came near to me, pressing close. Oh, he tried to kiss me, but I held him off. Oh, why, uh, why do you plague me, he said. <laughs> I don't wish to be kissed. Yeah, you're a strange creature, Mrs. Carleon. You prov or isn't she supposed to be the older aunt? Like, as far as this person knows, she's like 40 years older than him. Just really good skin. You provoke, and then you become prim. Is it fair? I came here to see the virgins of the moonlight. And he put his hands on my shoulders. It held me against the stone. Six virgins. There might be seven here tonight. Oh my god, this is nightmarish. How old is he again? Thirteen? It sounds, he talks like a thirteen-year-old. Uh, you've forgotten the story, I said. It was because they weren't virgins. Precisely, Miss Carleon. Uh, are you going to turn to stone tonight? Oh, what do you mean? He's trying to say you're a virgin. Uh, don't you know the legend? Anyone who stands here in the moonlight and touches one of these stones is in danger. Uh, from what, impertinent young men? 
He put his face close to mine. He looked satanic with the false mustaches and his eyes glinting through the mask. You haven't heard the legend? <clears throat> oh, but you didn't come here in these parts, did you, Miss Carolyn? I must tell you, if the question is asked, are you a virgin, you cannot answer yes. You'll be turned into stone. I'm asking you now. I tried to wriggle free. I wish to return to the house. You haven't answered the question. Uh, I think you're not behaving like a gentleman. Do you know so well the ways of a gentleman? Uh, let me go. Then, when you answer my questions, I've already asked the first, and now I want the answer to the second. I shall answer no questions. Then, he said, I shall be forced to satisfy my curiosity and impatience. Oh my God, what is he planning on doing? With a swift gesture, he snatched at my mask, and as it came away from his hand, I heard the sudden gasp of amazement. Oh, that's how he's going to satisfy? He just wants to see your face? I thought he was going to check her virginity in a different way. I'm old. Old people have gross thoughts. So, Miss Carolyon, he said, Carolyon. Then he began to chant, Ding dong bell, someone's in the well. Who put her in? Was it due to sin? What? He laughed. I'm right, am I not? I do remember you. You're not a girl one easily forgets, Miss Carolyon. And uh, what are you doing at our ball? I snatched the mask from him. I came because I was invited. Hmm, and deceived us very nicely. My mother is not in the habit of inviting cottagers to St. Lampson's Ball. I'm a friend of Meliora's. Oh, yes, Meliora. Now, who would have thought her capable of this? I wonder what my mother is going to say when I tell her. But you won't, I said, and I was annoyed with myself because there seemed to be a note of pleading in my voice. Uh, but you don't think it's my duty? He was mocking. Of course, for a consideration, I might agree to join in the deception. Keep away, I warned. There is no question of a consideration. He put his head on one side and regarded me with a puzzled look. Uh, you give yourself airs, my cottage beauty. I live at the parsonage, I retorted. I'm being educated there. Oh, he mocked. Tra-la-la, and then I wish to return to the ball. Maskless? Doubtless known by some of the servants. Oh, Miss Carleon. I turned from him and started to run. Ah, there's no reason why I should return to the ballroom. The evening was spoilt with a tea for me in any case. I would go back to the parsonage and at least preserve my dignity. He ran after me and caught my arm. Ah, where are you going? And I'm, as I'm not returning to the ballroom, there's no concern of yours. I say, you're going to leave us? No, please don't do that. I was only teasing you. Don't you recognize a joke when you hear one? That's something you have to learn. I don't want you to leave the ball. I want to help. Could you repair the mask? Yes, with a needle and thread. And I will get them for you if you come with me. Well, I hesitated, not trusting him, but the temptation to go back was too great to be resisted. Oh, he led me to a wall which was covered with ivy and, pushing this aside, disclosed a door. And then we passed through this. We were in the walled garden, and straight ahead of us was a spot in the bones that had been discovered. And he was talking, uh, taking me to the oldest wing of the abbess. He opened a heavily studded door, and we were in a dank passage. There was a lengthum hanging on the wall, which gave a feeble light, uh, Johnny took this down and, holding it high above his head, turned to grin at me. He looked satanic, and I wanted to run, but I knew if I did, I could not return to the ball. So, when he said, come on, I followed him up a spiral staircase, the steps of which were steep and worn down by the tread of our feet over hundreds of years. He turned to me and said in a hollow voice, We are in that part of the house which is certainly the old coven. Uh, this is where the, our virgins lived. Eerie, don't you think? I agreed. At the top of the staircase, he paused. I saw a door, a corridor, in which there appeared to be a row of cells, and when I followed Johnny into one of these, I saw the stone ledge cut in the wall, which might have served as a bed for a nut. I saw a narrow slit, unprotected by glass, which could have been her window. Johnny set down the lengthum and grinned at me. Now we want a needle and thread, he said. Or do we? I was alarmed. I'm sure you won't find one here. Never mind. Uh, there are more important things in life, as I do assure you. Give me the mask. I refused and turned away. But he was beside me. I might have been very frightened if I had remembered that this was only Johnny St. Lamston, who I regarded as a boy not much older than myself, with a gesture which took him completely by surprise, and using all my strength, I pushed him from me, and he went sprawling backwards, tripping over the lanthorn, this isn't going to be good, uh, which was my opportunity. I ran along the corridor, clutching my mask in hand, looking for the spiral staircase which we had ascended. I could not find it but came to another which led upwards, and although I knew I should not be going further into the house <clears throat> then when I wanted to leave it, uh, I dared turn back for fear of meeting Johnny. 
There was a rope attached to the wall to serve as a banister because the stairs were so steep, and I saw that it could be dangerous not to use it. This was a part of the house which was rarely used, but on this night, presumably in some uh, guests should lose their way and find themselves in this wing. Lanthorns had placed at intervals. The light was dim and just enough to show the way. I discovered more alcoves, uh, like those which Johnny had taken me. I stood listening, wondering whether it could be wise to retrace my steps. My heart was racing, and I could not help glancing furtively about me. I was prepared at any moment to see the ghostly figures of nuns coming toward me. Ah, that was the effect of being alone in this most ancient part of the house had on me, and the, the gate of the ball seemed uh, far away, not only in distance, but in time. I had to get away quickly. Cautiously, I tried to retrace my steps, but when I uh, came to a corridor through which I knew I had not passed before, I began to feel frantic. Oh my god! That's a full hour of reading. I planned on reading 40 pages apiece, but my god, this is going to be a two hour long episode. Uh, why, don't, why don't we take a break before I lose my mind? Uh, and we'll go down to the basement where I can tell you about other books that Penguin Random House has to offer. Go on, get downstairs. I'm going to play the guitar at you. Ah, oh, well, there you are. Uh, here in my basement. Can you tell by the new sound effects I'm really going with this whole basement theme? Sure you can. Uh, you're not unintelligent. Uh, I'm going to read to you as I play this beautiful little guitar. Uh, Garfield, Fully Caffeinated by Jim Davis. Uh, a Bart, about, a Bart, Garfield, Fully Caffeinated? Well, uh, Garfield's back in this brand new full color compilation comic book strip. Uh, truly a must have for fans. Garfield was born to be wired. Uh, yeah, Garfield, you scamp. Uh, coffee and lots of it. <laughs> oh, I know that story. Is the only way to kickstart his day. <laughs> Got chocolate? <laughs> yeah, 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 he'll binge on that too. Garfield lovers will get a jolt of joy. Oh, I get it. Coffee related. Uh, from this new collection of comics guaranteed to boost your spirits. That's the end of that review. Do you want to hear about Jim Davis? I got time to waste. Jim Davis was born July 28, 1945 in Marion, Indiana. Yuck. He uh, later attended uh, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Yuck. Where he distinguished himself by earning one of the lowest college grade point averages in the history of the university. Uh, that's it. Okay, well, at least he wasn't a, a nerdlinger. Uh... Well, that's Garfield, fully caffeinated. The cover of it shows Garfield with a real big smile and some crazy eyes holding up a, a coffee cup that says uh, empty with the gauge that says empty to full. And this one says full. And he's giving a thumbs up. That's Garfield for you. The guy's nuts. Uh, it's a uh, paperback for 16 bucks, December 5th, uh, 2023. Uh, you can get it at Amazon, Barnes Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Powell's Target, and you know... He's finally made it, that Jim Davis has finally made it. His career has finally gone somewhere after all this time when he's on the sweet, sweet hollowed shelves of Walmart. Well, with that uh, waste of time, why don't we uh, get back to the library and read for another hour. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Now you're all settled in. Um, put your book away. I can't believe you're reading a book while I read this to you. Uh, you come here against the will. All right, let's move on. I thought, what if they never discovered me again? What if I remained locked away in this part of the house forever? Oh, it would be kind of walling up. Oh, they would come for the lanthorns. Uh, but why should they? They should uh, gradually go out one by one and know to think of relighting them until there was another ball or a house party at the Abbas. This was a panic. It was more likely that I should be discovered wandering about the house and recognized. They should be suspicious of me and accuse me of trying to steal, and they were always suspicious of people like myself. Uh, I tried to think calmly of what I knew of the house. The old wing was that part which looked down on the walled garden. 
That was where I must be, dot, 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 perhaps close to the spot where the nun's bones had been discovered. And the thought made me shiver. Oh, it was so gloomy in the passages. There was no covering on the floor of the corridor, uh, which was cold stone like the spiral stairs. And I wondered if it were true that when something violent happened to people, their spirits haunted the scene of their last hours on Earth. Oh, I thought of her being brought along these corridors from one of those alcoves, which uh, would have been in her cell. Oh, what terrible despair there must have been in her, in her heart. How frightened she must have been. I took courage. My situation was comic compared with hers. And I, yes, And I was not afraid, I told myself, if necessary, I should tell exactly how I came to be in this situation. Lady St. Lampston would then be more annoyed with Johnny than with me. At the end of the stone corridor was a heavy door, which I opened cautiously. It was like stepping into another world. The corridor was carpeted. Oh, there are lamps hanging at frequent intervals about the wall. And I could hear the sound of music, uh, though muted, which I had lost before. Oh, I, oh, I was relieved. Uh, now to find my way to the dressing rooms. There would be pins there. What? And I even believed that I had been in, uh, seen in some little alabaster bowl. I wondered. I hadn't thought of it before. I had an uncanny feeling that thinking of the seventh virgin had helped me by calming my mind, which was overexcited by the mingling of Anacosta wine and strange events. This was a fast house. I had heard it contained about a uh, hundred rooms, and I paused by a door, and hoping this might lead me toward that wing with the ball which had been being held, gently turned the handle and opened it. I gasped with horror, for in the dim light, oh god, she's going to watch people having sex, uh, uh, from the shaded lamp which stood by the bed, it seemed that those first seconds I was looking at a, a corpse. Well, I guess it's better than watch people have sex. A man who was propped up by pillows. His mouth and, and one eye were drawn uh, down on the left side. It was grotesque sight in seeing... Well, he just had a stroke or something. It was grotesque sight in seeing it so soon after my fanciful thoughts in the corner. I believed I was seeing a ghost, for it was a dead face. Dots. Almost. Then, to my horror, as I stood there, something told me uh, that I had seen there was a strange sound from the figure in the bed. Yeah, it's just the poor guy with a stroke. I shut the door quickly, my heart pounding. Well, he probably wanted, like, a glass of water or something. And the man I had seen in the bed was a travesty of Sir Justin. I was horrified by the thought that someone who had been so robust, so arrogant, uh, could become like that. Somehow, I must have reached the family's sleeping quarters. If I had met anyone now, I would say I was looking for the dressing rooms and lost my way, and I clutched again the torn mask in my hand and hesitated uh, by a half-open door. Looking inside, I saw a bedroom. Two lamps. Oh, now it's going to be people having sex again. Uh, on the wall, give a dim light. It suddenly occurred to me that on that dressing table, there might possibly be some pins. Uh, I looked along the corridor, and there was no sign of anyone. So I stepped into the room, and sure enough, on the mirror, looped by satin ribbons, was a pincushion with pins sticking in it. Oh, I took several and was about to make for the door, but I heard voices in the corridor. Oh, a sudden panic seized me, uh, and I had to get out of this room quickly. Old fears came back to me like those I had had, had had, I hate it when they do that, two hads in a row, I had had on the night when Joe was missing. If Meliora was found in one of these rooms... Uh, and said that she had lost her way. Oh, oh, everyone would believe her. But if I were, and they knew who I was, oh, that would subject me to the humiliation of suspicion. I must not be found here. I looked about me and saw that there were two doors. Without thinking that I opened and stepped it forward, uh, it, was a, it was a cupboard in which clothes were kept, uh, were hanging, and there was no time to escape, so I shut the door and held my breath. In a few terrifying seconds, I knew that someone had come into the room. Oh, I heard the door shut and waited intensely for discovery. Oh, I must tell everything about Johnny trying to make me, uh, trying to make love to me and, and who I was. I must uh, make them believe me, and I should open the door at once to explain. And if I were caught, I should look so guilty. <clears throat> and if I went out and explained right away, which is what uh, Meliora would have done, oh, I should be more likely believed. But what if they didn't believe me? Well, I hesitated too long. Uh, a voice said, eh, But what is it, Judith? A weary voice, which I knew to belong to Justin St. Larnston. I had to see you, darling, just to be alone with you for a few minutes. I had to be reassured. Surely you understand? Oh, Judith, his wife. Her voice was what I would have expected. She spoke in short sentences as though she were breathless. And there was a feeling of tension which was immediately apparent. Uh, uh, Judith, you must not get so excited. 
Excited? Uh, how can I help it when I saw you and that girl dancing together? Oh, uh, listen to me, Judith. His voice sounded low and drawing almost. And perhaps uh, that was in contrast to Oh, she's only the parson's daughter. Uh, she's beautiful. Uh, you think so, don't you? And young. Oh, oh, so very young. And I could see the way she looked when you were dancing together. Yeah, Judith, this is quite absurd. Uh, I've known the child since she was in a cradle. Naturally, I had to dance with her. You know how one must uh, be at these affairs. Uh, but you seemed... You seemed... Weren't you dancing? Or were you watching me all the time? Well, you know how I feel. I was aware of you, Justin. Aware of you and that girl. You may laugh, but there was something I had to be reassured. Oh, but really, Judith, there's nothing to reassure about. You're my wife, aren't you? Isn't that enough? Well, everything, just everything. Uh, that's why I couldn't bear it. Well, that's what's... Forget it. Uh, we shouldn't be here. We can't disappear like this. All right, but kiss me, Justin. Silence. During which I felt they, uh, I, they must hear my heart beating. I had been right not to show myself, and as soon as they had gone, I would creep out and quickly repair my mask with the pins, and then all would be well. Uh, uh, come on, Judith, let's go. Once more, darling. Oh, darling, how I wish we didn't have to go back to those tiresome people. It'll soon be over. Oh, darling. Silence. The shutting of a door. And I wanted to rush out, but I forced myself to stay there while I counted to ten. Then, cautiously, I opened the door, peering out into an empty room, sped to its door, and with a sigh of thankfulness, reached the corridor. I almost ran from that open door, trying to rid myself of the picture of one of them opening the door. They're saying the word door a lot. This author says the word door a lot in two paragraphs. And finding me hiding in the cupboard. But it hadn't happened. But oh, oh, it was a warning not to do such a silly thing again. The music was louder. As I reached the staircase where Lady St. Lawrenceon received us, now I knew my way. In my anxiety, I had forgotten uh, my mask until I saw Meliora with Kim. Ah, your mask, cried Meliora. I held it up. Ah, it's broken, but I found some pins. Kim said, ah, well, I believe it's carrots. I looked at him shamefacedly. Meliora turned to him. Well, uh, why not, she said fiercely. Karen so wanted to come to the ball. Uh, why shouldn't she? Uh, I said uh, she was a friend of mine, and so she is. Why not indeed, agreed Kim. Uh, how did it break? asked Meliora. Uh, my stitches weren't strong enough, I expect. Odd. Uh, uh, let me look. She took the mask. Oh, I see. Uh, give me the pins, and now I'll fix it. Uh, it'll last. Uh, did you know that there's only half an hour to midnight? I lost count of time. Meliora fixed the mask, and I felt pleased to hide behind it. Uh, we've just been out in my garden, said Meliora. The, the moonlight's wonderful. Oh, I know. I've been out there, too. Let's get back to the ballroom now, said Meliora. There's not much time left. So we went back, uh, Kim escorting us. A partner came to ask me to dance, and I felt hilariously happy to be masked and dancing again. Uh, well, I congratulated myself on my escape. Then I remembered that uh, Johnny St. Lampson knew who I was. Uh, but I didn't really attach much importance to that. And if he told his mother, I should quickly let her know how he had behaved. And I fancied that she would not be any more pleased with him than with me. I danced with Kim later, and I was glad because I wanted to know what his reactions were. He was clearly amused. Uh, Carly on, he said. Uh, that's what puzzles me. I thought you were Miss Carly. Meliora gave me that name. Oh, Meliora. And I told him all that happened while he was away at the university. How Meliora had seen me at the fair and taken me home. Oh, oh, he listened intently. Well, I'm glad it happened, he told me. And it's good for you and for her. I glowed with pleasure. He was so different from Johnny St. Lampston. And your, and your brother, he asked. How's he getting on with the, at the vet? Oh, you knew? He laughed. <laughs> I'm rather interested in his progress since I was I who mentioned uh, uh, what an asset he would be. You spoke to Pollant? Oh, I did. And I made him promise to give the boy a chance. Uh, I see. I suppose I should thank you. I uh, don't if you'd rather not. Uh, my granny's so pleased. He's getting on well, and the vet is pleased uh, with him. <clears throat> I heard a note of pride in my voice. Uh, he, he's pleased with the vet. Nah, uh, good news. I thought that a uh, boy who had risked so much for the sake of a bird must have a special gift, so all goes well. Uh, Tess, I repeated, all goes well. May I, uh, I think it's Tess. It says Tess, but again, this book is all warped and weird that uh, maybe the T is supposed to be a Y. Who knows? I pronounce it as Tess because that's the way I read it on the page. Uh, may I that I think you have grown up just as much as I thought you would? Oh, how's that? Uh, you have become an extremely fascinating young lady. 
What a number of emotions I experienced on that night. Uh, for Dancing with Kim, I knew absolute happiness. And I wished it could have gone on, but dances quickly come to an end when you have the partner of your choice, and all too soon, the clocks, which had been brought into the hall to strike at the midnight hour, began chiming at once. Yeah, clocks, clocks, judgy clocks that keep making you shut up when you're on a roll. Oh, the music stopped. Oh, it was time to take off our masks. Johnny stayed Lampson, uh, passed near us. Oh, and he grinned at me. Uh, it's no surprise, he said. It is still a pleasure. Oh, and there was a purpose in his mocking smile. Kim led me outside so that no one else would know that Miss Carleon was really poor Car Karen Sacarly. As Belter drove us home to the parsonage, neither Melioro nor I spoke very much. We were both still hearing the music, caught up in the rhythm of the dance. And it was night, and we should never forget. Later, we would talk of it, but now we were still bemused and enchanted. Uh, we went soberly to our rooms. I was physically tired, yet had no desire to sleep, and while I kept on my red velvet gown, ah, oh, weird, I was still a young lady who went to balls. But once I took it off, uh, life became less exciting. In fact, uh, Miss Carleon would become Karen Sicarly. Uh, but obviously, I could not stand before the mirror staring dreamily at my reflection all night, so by the light of two candles, I reluctantly took the comb from my hair and let it fall about my shoulders, undressed, and hung up the red velvet gown. You have become an extremely fascinating young lady, I said. Then I thought of how exciting my life was going to be because it was true that life was yours to make as you wanted to. It was uh, difficult to sleep. I kept thinking about myself dancing with Kim, fighting with Johnny, hiding in the cupboard, and that horrific moment when I had opened the door to Sir Justin's room and seen him. So it was surprising that when I did sleep, I had a nightmare. Uh, I dreamt that Johnny had walled me up and that I was uh, uh, suffocating while Meliora was trying to pull the bricks with her bare hands, and I knew that she would not be able to save me in time. I woke, screaming to find Meliora standing by my bed. Her golden hair was about her shoulders, and she had uh, not put a dressing gown over her flannelette flannel, flannel nightdress. I suppose it's a real word. I can't tell what's real and what's not when you get a book that's completely screwed up because somebody messed it up and then sold it on uh, Amazon. Wake up, Karen, sir, she said. You're having a nightmare. Oh, I sat up and stared at her hands. Well, uh, what on earth was it? I dreamed I was walled up and that you were trying to save me. I was suffocating. Well, I don't wonder at it. Uh, you were buried right under the bedclothes, and I think that all that dash and duras and mead. Well, she sat in my bed laughing at me, but I could still feel my nightmare hanging over me. Oh, what an evening, she said, uh, and clasping her, her knees, stared before her. And at the sense of, uh, of nightmare faded, I remembered what I had just heard from the cover. It was Meliora's dancing with Justin that had just provoked Judah's jealousy. I sat up. You danced with Justin, didn't you? I said. I, uh, of course. His wife didn't like, it, didn't, like, didn't like him dancing with you. Uh, how do you know? Well, I told her what happened to me, and her eyes opened wide. And she sprang up, took me by the shoulders, and shook me. Karen, sir, I have to know something <clears throat> that would, if it happened to you. Tell me every word you heard and that you were in the cupboard. I have, as far as I can remember, I was horribly scared. I would think so. What on earth made you? I don't know. I just thought it might be the only thing to do at the time. Uh, was she right, Meliora? Right? To be jealous? Meliora laughed. <laughs> She's married to him, she said, and I was not sure whether the flippancy uh, hit a certain bitterness. Well, we were silent for a while, each preoccupied with their own thoughts, and, uh, and I was the one to break it. I said, I think you've uh, always liked Justin. Oh, it's time for confidences and indiscretions. The magic of the ball was still with us, and Meliora and I were closer that night than we had ever been before. Now he's uh, different than Johnny, she said. I should hope for his wife's sake that he is. Oh, no, uh, no one to be safe with Johnny around. Justin doesn't seem to notice people. Uh, meeting uh, Grecians with long golden hair? Meeting everybody. He seems remote. Perhaps he ought to have uh, uh, been a monk, eh? Eh? Rather than a... <clears throat> than, a than a... Than a husband? <laughs> What things you say, she started to talk to Justin then. Uh, the first time she and her father had been invited to take tea with the St. Lawrenstons, and now she had worn a sprigged muslin dress for the occasion. Oh, how polite Justin had been. I could see that she had a kind of childish adoration for him, and I hoped that it was all because I didn't want her to be hurt. By the way, she said, Kim told me he was going away. Oh, to Australia, I think. Right away, my voice sounded 
blank in spite of my efforts to control it, uh, for a long time. He's going to sail with his father, but he said he might stay in Australia for a time because he has an uncle there. Ah, uh, the enchantment of the ball seemed to have disappeared. Are you tired? asked Meliora. Well, it must be very late. Early in the morning, rather. Well, we ought to get some sleep. She nodded, and we went into her, went into her own room. Strange how we both seem suddenly to have lost our exhilaration. Was it because she was thinking of Justin and his passionately loving wife? Was it because I was thinking of Kim, who was going away and had told her, not me? Oh, it's about a week after the ball when uh, Dr. Millard paid a visit to the parsonage, and I was on the front lawn when his broham drew up and he called good morning to me, and I knew that the Reverend Charles had been seeing him recently, and I guessed uh, that he had come to discover how he was. Ah, uh, the Reverend Charles Martin is not at home, I told him. Uh, good. Is it Miss Martin I've come to see? Is she home? Oh, yes. Then, uh, would you be so kind as to tell her I'm here? Uh, certainly, I said. Pray, come in. Well, I, I took him into the drawing room, went to find Meliora, and she was sewing in her room and seemed startled when I told her that Dr. Miller wanted to see her. Uh, she, uh, she hurried down to him at once, and I went to my room, wondering if Meliora was ill and had been consulting the doctor secretly. Half an hour later, the broham drove away, and the door of my room was flung open, and Meliora came in. Her face was white, and her eyes looked almost dark. I had never seen her like that before. Oh, Karen, says she said, this is terrible. Uh, tell me, what is it all about? It's Papa. Dr. Hiller says he's gravely ill. Oh, Meliora. He says Papa has some kind of growth, and that he's been advised him uh, to have a second opinion. Papa didn't tell me, and I didn't know he'd been seeing the doctors. Well, now they think they know, Karen, sir, and I can't bear it. They say he's gonna die. Yeah, but they can't know. Well, they're almost certain. Uh, three months, Dr. Hillard thinks. Oh, no. But he says that Papa mustn't go on working because he's on the verge of collapse. Uh, he wants him to go to bed and rest. She buried her face in her hands, and I went to her and put my arms around her. We clung together. They can't be sure, I insisted. Oh, but I can't believe that. I knew now that I had seen death in the Reverend Charles' face. Everything had changed. Each day, the Reverend Charles was a little worse. Meliora and I nursed him. She insisted on giving him every attention, and I insisted on helping her. Uh, David Killigrew had come to the parsonage, and he was a curate who was uh, to take over the parson's duties until, as they said, something could be arranged, and they really uh, meant until the Reverend Charles died. Uh, the autumn came, and Meliora and I hardly ever went out. <clears throat> oh, we did a few lessons, although Miss Kello was still with us, because most of our time was spent in and out of the sick room, and it was a strangely different household. And I think we were all grateful for uh, David Killigrew, who was in his late twenties, and one of the gentlest people I had ever met. Oh, he went quietly about the house, making very little trouble, and yet he could preach a good sermon and attend to parish affairs with an efficiency which was amazing. Oh, Oh, he would often sit with Reverend Charles and talk to him about the parish. Oh, and he would talk to us, too, and in a short time, we almost forgot what his presence meant in the house, for he seemed like a member of the family. Oh, he cheered us and made us feel that he was grateful for our company as for the servants, and they, made a, and they took to him and the servants as the people of the parish did, and for a long time it seemed as though his state affairs would go on indefinitely. Christmas came... A uh, sad Christmas for us. Mrs. Yeo made some preparation in the kitchen because, as she said, the servants expected it, and she knew it was the Reverend. Uh, it would be his wish. David agreed with her, and, and she set about making the cakes and uh, the puddings, uh, just as she had every year. And I went out with David to, to get in the holly and uh, cut it. I said, uh, why do we do this? Uh, we None of us feel like making merry. Well, he looked at me sadly and answered, It's better to go on hoping. Is it? Eh. Well, we can't help knowing that the end is near and what what the end will be. Well, we, uh, we live by hope, he told me. And I admitted that was true, and I looked at him sharply. Uh, uh, for what do you hope? I asked. Well, he was silent for a moment. Then he said, I, I suppose that every man hopes for a, a fireside, uh, my own family. And, 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 and you know what your hopes will be realized? We well, moved closer to me and answered, if I should get a living. And not till then. Oh, I have my mother to care for. My first duty is to her. Where is she now? Uh, she is uh, in the care of her niece, who is staying at our little house until I return. 
and he pricked his finger on a holly, and he sucked it, shamefaced way, and I noticed that, that there was a warm flush under his skin while he's sucking blood. That's what happens when you suck blood. When you suck your own blood, it just makes you warmer. Uh, he was embarrassed, and he was thinking that when the Reverend Charles died, that he had a good chance of being offered the living. On Christmas Eve, the carol singers came to the parsonage and sang uh, the first Noel softly uh, below the Reverend Charles's window. At the kitchen table, Mrs. Yeo was making the Christmas bush by fastening two wooden hoops together and decorating them with furs and evergreens. And she would hang it in the window of the sick room just to pretend that we were not too sad to celebrate Christmas. David dealt with the services uh, in a manner which gave satisfaction to everyone I heard. Mrs. Yeo commenting to Belter that if it had to happen, this was the best way. And it was on the twelfth night that Kim called. I've always uh, hated the Twelfth Night since, telling myself often that it was because all the Christmas decorations were taken down then, and that was the end of the festivities until next year. And I, uh, I saw Kim riding up on the chestnut mare uh, he always rode, and I thought how fine and manly he looked. Not wicked like Johnny or saintly like Justin, exactly, exactly as a man should look. And I knew I'd come since he told us that he would uh, call to say goodbye, and he seemed sad at the time for departure grew near. I went out to meet him, because I believed that I was the one he regretted leaving. Well, well, well. Why, he cried, it's Miss Carrotsa. I saw you arriving. Belter had come to take his horse, and Kim started toward the entrance. I wanted to delay him, to, to, to have him to myself. Before we joined Meliora, Miss, is, she's, she's becoming obsessive, and Miss Kello, who I knew were in the drawing room. Hey, when, uh, when are you leaving? I asked, trying to hide my desolation in my voice. Tomorrow. Well, I don't believe you want to go one bit. Uh, just one bit does, he says. Uh, the rest hates to leave home. Uh, then why go? Oh, my dear Karen, sir, all the arrangements have been made. I, so, I see no reason why they should be canceled. Alas, he replied, I do. Kim, I said passionately, burp, if you don't want to go, uh, but I want to go across the seas to make a fortune. What for? Uh, to come back rich and famous. Why? So that I can settle down, marry and raise a family. These were almost exactly the same words David Killigrew had used. Perhaps uh, this was a common desire. Uh, then you will, Kim, I said earnestly. He laughed, <laughs> leaning toward me, and kissed me lightly on the forehead. That's deflating. And I felt wildly happy, because well, you're you know, just going for any crumbs he'll throw you, and almost immediately desperately sad. <clears throat> you look so uh, prophetis. Uh, prophetis. Well, we're looking that up. I think I know what it means. A female prophet. Yeah, okay. Well, I just wasted everyone's time. He told me as though he excused the kiss. Then he went on lightly. I believe you are some sort of witch. Well, the nicest sort, of course. For a moment, we stood smiling at each other before we went on. This cutting wind can't be good, even for witches. He slipped his arm through mine, and we went into the house together. And in the drawing room, Meliora and Miss Kello were waiting as soon as we arrived, and Miss Kello rang for tea. Kim talked mainly, oh, about Australia, of which he seemed to know a great deal. He glowed with enthusiasm, and I loved listening to him, and saw vividly the land he had described, the harbor with its indentations, the sandy beaches fringed with foliage, the brilliant plumage of strange birds, the moist heat, which made you feel as though you were in a steamy bath, and it would be a summer there now, he told us. He talked of the station to which he was going and how cheap land was. Oh, and labor, too. And I thought with pain of the night when my brother had lain in a man trap, and this man had carried him to safety. But for Kim, my brother Joe might be cheap labor, in quotes, but on the other side of the world. Oh, Kim, I thought, I wish I were going with you. But I was not sure that that was true. I wanted to live in St. Lamston Abbas like a lady. Did I really want to live on some lonely station in a strange and uncultivated land, even, even with Kim? Oh, is my wild dream for Kim to stay and for Kim to own the Abbas instead of the St. Lamptons. I wanted to share the Abbas with Kim. Karen says, thoughtful. Kim was watching me quizzically. Tenderly, I wondered. 
I was imagining it all. You make it sound so real. Oh, you wait till I come back. And then, oh, I shall have some stories to tell you. He shook hands with us as he was leaving and kissed first Meliora, uh, and then me. Oh, I'll be back, he said. You see. <clears throat> I went on remembering these words long after he had gone. It was not that I overheard a precise conversation. It was little hints I caught now and then which made me understand uh, what was in people's minds. No one had any doubt that the Reverend Charles was dying. Sometimes he seemed a little better, eh, but it was never really pro progressed week by week. Saw his strength slowly slipping away. Oh, and I wondered constantly about what would happen to us when he died. For it was clear that the state of affairs, uh, which now existed, was only a compromise. Miss Yeo gave me the first clue when she was speaking of David Killigrew, I guess. The book just screwed that whole thing up. I'm thinking it's killer guru, whatever. I realized that she accepted him as the new master of the house. She believed, and I realized, that this had occurred to many others. Uh, that when Reverend Charles died, David Killigrew, oh, I did get it right, uh, would be the living. Oh, he would become the parson here. And Meliora? Well, Meliora was a parson's daughter. So it'd be reasonable to suppose that she would make a good parson's wife. Yes, 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 yes. It had seemed to them right and reasonable, so it hinted at it that it was inevitable. Meliora and David. Ah, they were good friends, and she was grateful to him, and he must admire her. Suppose they were right. What would happen to me? Oh, I shouldn't leave Meliora. David had always shown the utmost friendliness toward me. I should stay on in the parsonage, make myself useful. Eh, in what capacity? Maid, eh, to Meliora? Eh, she never treated me as maid, and I was the sister that she had always wanted, yet because you just happen to have the same name, you weirdo, and who had the same name as the one she had lost. Yeah, we just talked about that. Some weeks after Kim's departure, I met Johnny St. Lampston near the Pengraster farm. Well, I had been to see Granny and to take her a basket of food. And I was preoccupied because, although she had talked animatedly about the day that she had spent at the vet's house, uh, where she had been invited for Christmas Day, she looked thin, and her eyes seemed less bright than usual. I noticed, too, that she still coughed too much. I was just going to say, as this has been going on, uh, she's really not going back home to hang out with Granny a whole heck of a lot. Uh, so she just kind of comes back with a basket and like, well, I hope you can survive. I'll see you in two weeks. And then just takes off again to hang out with rich people. My anxiety was due to the fact that I came from a house of sickness, I told myself. Because the Reverend St. Charles was ill, I was expecting everyone of his age to be threatened. Granny had told me how much at home Joe was at the vet's house and how they treated him like one of the family. Now he has an excellent state of affairs, uh, for although the vet had four daughters and had no son, so he was pleased to have a boy like Joe to help him. Oh, I was a little melancholy when I left the cottage, and there were so many shadows threatening my life. The sickness in the house, which I had come to regard as home, the apprehension over Granny's health, uh, Joe, too, in a way, sitting at the vet's table instead of that of Dr. Billard. Uh, hello, Johnny was sitting on the steel style, which had, I'm not looking that up, which had led to the Pengaster fields. He leaped down and fitted his step to mine. Now, I've been hoping we should meet. I just imagine them doing like step by step, like a, some sort of like song and dance performance where they're walking like cross each other's legs. Uh, I've been hoping we should meet. Is that so? Oh, allow me to carry your basket. There's no need. It's empty. And where are you going? Uh, my pretty maid. Hey, you seem to have a fondness for nursery rhymes. Is that because you have not grown up yet? Mm -hmm. My face is my fortune, sir, she had said. He quoted, it's true, Miss Er. Carleon, uh, but watch that sharp tongue of yours. Uh, by the way, why Carleon? Why not St. Ives Marzan? Uh, Carleon, it suits you, you know. I quicken my steps. I'm really in a hurry. Oh, a pity. I was hoping we should be able to renew our acquaintance. Uh, I should have seen you before, don't doubt it, but I have been away and I'm only just back. Well, you will soon be re uh, returning, I dare say. Oh, do you mean you hope? <laughs> oh, Karen, sir, why don't you be friends with me? I want you to be, you know. Well, you go the wrong way about making friends, perhaps. Well, then you must show me the right way. 
He gripped my arm and pulled my face to him. There was a light in his eyes which alarmed me, though I thought of a uh, way he had looked at for, for Pe- uh, Hetty Pengaster in church and how I had seen him on the stile. He had probably been coming from some rendezvous with her. I twisted my arm free. Uh, let me alone, I said. And not just now, always. I am not Hetty Pengaster. Oh, he was startled. Oh, there was no doubt of that because I escaped with ease. I ran, <clears throat> and when I looked over my shoulder, he was still standing, staring after me. By the end of January, Reverend St. Charles became so ill that he was given sedatives by the doctor, which resulted in long hours of sleep. Meliora and I would sit quietly, talking as we sewed, or perhaps read, and every now and then one of us would rise to look into the sick room. David Killigrew was with us every moment he could spare, and we both agreed that his presence soothed us. Oh, sometimes Mrs. Yeo brought food, and she would always cast a fond eye on the young man, and I had heard her declare to Beltier that when this unhappy business was over, her first task would be to build up the young parson. Uh, Besser Kit would come in and make up the fire, and the glances they bestowed upon him and Meliora were significant to me, though uh, perhaps not to... Him or Meliora, uh, the latter's thoughts were occupied with their father. A melancholy peace pervaded the house. Inevitable death was with us. Oh, but with that had to pass. And then when it was over, we would grow away from it and nothing would be changed. Insomuch as uh, those who now served one person would serve another. Meliora and David, oh, it would be inevitable. Meliora would settle down in time, and she would cease to have dreams about a knight whose devotion had been given to another lady. And I, I looked up and caught David's eyes on mine. Oh, he smiled when he realized that I had caught him. And there was something revealing in that glance. Had I been mistaken? I was disturbed, but that's not how things were expected to work out. During the next few days, oh, I knew what I had suspected was a certainty. Uh, I was sure after that conversation. Uh, it was not exactly a proposal of marriage because uh, David was not the sort of man to propose marriage until he was in a position to afford to keep a wife. Uh, as a curate with an aged mother to support, he was not. But if, as he must believe since everyone else did, he acquired the St. Lampson living, uh, it would be a different matter. Oh, he and I were sitting beside the fire alone, for Meliora was at her father's bedside. <laughs> he said to me, You regard this as your home, Miss Carly? And I agreed. I have heard how you came here, and I knew that was inevitable. As a subject gossip, it had uh, ceased to be, it never ceased to be interesting, except, of course, when there was a newcomer who had not heard it before. I admire you and what you've done, he went on, and I think that you are most. Most wonderful, and I imagine that you hope never to leave the parsonage. <laughs> I'm not sure, I said. Uh, he had made me wonder what I did hope for. Oh, to live at the parsonage had not been my dream. Uh, the night when I had uh, dressed in red velvet and masked, walked up the uh, staircase to be received by Lady St. Larnston had been more uh, like a dream come true than living at the parsonage had ever been. Oh, of course, you're unsure. There are matters in life which require a great deal of thought. I myself have been reviewing my own life. You see, Miss Carly, a man in my present con- position cannot afford to marry. But if that, <coughs> if that position should change, four dots, end quote... Oh, he paused. Oh, and I thought, oh, is he asking me to marry him when the reverend's dead? <laughs> this is so creepy. Basically, this person's just waiting for the person to die. And it's like, now I'm here. Oh, this is horrible. And he has stepped into his shoes. Oh, he felt ashamed that he should be thinking of a future uh, for which he must wait until another was dead. I think, he went on, that you would make an excellent parson's wife. Miss Carly, I laughed. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, but why not? Everything would be wrong. My background, for one thing. Oh, he snapped his fingers. You are yourself. That is all that matters. My character. Uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, it's hardly uh, serious or pious. Oh, my dear Miss Carly, you underrate yourself. Well, you know little. You know little about me. I laughed in vain. <laughs> and whatever I under, underrated myself, had I not always felt the power in myself that I believe would carry me wherever I wanted to go. Uh, I, I was, uh, I was as arrogant in my way as Lady Saint Lawrence is in hers. Truly, I thought 
Love is blind, for I was becoming increasingly clear to me that David Killigrew was falling in love with me. I, I'm sure what happened to Kim. I'm sure he went on that you would succeed with anything he undertook. Besides, dot, dot, dot. Well, I didn't finish for Meliora came out then. God damn it. Her face was drawn and anxious. God damn it, Meliora. I think he's worse, she said. Shut up, Mariola. Go back to your dad. It was Easter time and the church was decorated with daffodils when the Reverend Charles Martin died. Oh, he's dead. Ours was a house of mourning, and Meliora was inconsolable. For although we had known for so long that death was inevitable, well, yeah, you had a good solid year of him getting more and more yellow-skinned. When it came, it was still a blow, was it? Meliora spent the day in her room and would see no one. And when she asked for me, oh, I sat with her, and she talked of him. Oh, how good he had been to her, and how lost she felt without him. She recalled instance after instance of his kindness, his love and his care. Then she would weep quietly, and I wept with her, for I had been fond of him, and I hated to see Meliora so distressed. The day of the funeral came, and the tolling of the bell seemed to fill the house. Meliora looked beautiful in her black clothes, with the veil over her face. Oh, and black was less becoming of my dark looks, uh, and the dress I wore under my uh, black coat was too loose for me. The prancing horses, really prancing at a funeral, the waving black plumes, the mutes. What? The, the mutes? Like the people that can't talk, where they just like stand there and just kind of look around? The solemnity of the burial service, the standing round that grave where I had stood with Meliora, when she had told me that she had had, oh damn it, had had, again. The word had twice in the same sentence. A sister named Karensa. Oh, this was somber and melancholy. Yet... Even worse was coming back to the parsonage, which seemed empty because that quiet man, of whom I'd seen very little, was gone. All the mourners came back to the parsonage, and Lady St. Lampson and Justin with them, and they made our drawing room, in which ham sandwiches uh, were served. Uh, it seemed small and simple, although I had thought it very grand when I had first seen it. Justin spent most of the time with Meliora, and he was gentle, courteous, and seemed genuinely concerned. David was at my side, and I believed that very soon he would definitely ask me to marry him, and I wondered what I would say knowing, as I did, that others expected him to barely, uh, marry Meliora, while the mourners ate their sandwiches and drank the wine which Belter had, had been called in to serve, I was seeing myself uh, as mistress of the house. Oh, Lord, here we go. Miss Yeo and Belter were taking their orders from me, a far cry, one might say, from the girl who had set herself up on the hiring stand of the Trelenket Fair. A long way indeed. In the village, they would always remember Tarson's wife, uh, who came from the cottages, as she did. Oh, they would envy me and never quite accept me. But should I care? And yet, I had dreamed a dream. This would not be a, its fulfillment. I did not care for David Kelly Grew as I did for Kim, and I was not even sure that I wanted to be with Kim, who was so far from the abyss. When the mourners had left, Meliora went into her room, and Dr. Hillard, who had made up his mind that I was a sensible young woman, called and asked to see me. <clears throat> Miss Martin is uh, very distraught, he said, and I'm giving you a mild sedative for her, uh, but I don't want her to have it unless she needs it. Uh, she looks exhausted, but if she should be unable to sleep, give it to her. Uh, he smiled at me in his rather brusque way. He respected me. I began to dream, and then I was able to talk to him to interest him in Joe. I hated to find that my dreams, even for others, did not come true. I went into Meliora's room that night and found her sitting at the bedroom window looking out over the lawn to the graveyard. You'll catch cold, I said. Come to bed. Well, she shook her head. Uh, so I put a shawl about her shoulders, and drawing up a chair, sat beside her. Oh, Karen, sir, uh, everything will be different now. Don't you feel it? Burp, it must be so. I feel as though I'm in a sort of limbo, floating between two lives. The old life is over, the new one's about to begin. Well, for us both, I said. She gripped my hand. Yes, change for me means change for you. It seems now, Karen, sir, that your life is intertwined with mine. I wondered uh, what she should do now, and I believed I should stay on the parsonage if I vanished. But what of Meliora? What, uh, what happened to the daughters of the Parsons? And if they had no money, 
They became governess to my children. They became companions to elderly ladies. Ugh. What would uh, Meliora's fate be? And mine. Well, she did not seem to be concerned uh, with her own future. Her thoughts were still with her father. He is laying out there, she said, with my mother and the baby, little Carissa, and I wonder if his spirit has flown to heaven yet. Well, you shouldn't sit there brooding. Nothing can bring him back. Uh, I remember that he would not have wanted you to be unhappy. His great aim was to make you happy always. Well, he's the best father in the world, Carissa, and yet I could wish now that he had been harsh and cruel sometimes so that I did not have to mourn so much. She began to weep silently. I put my arm about her, and I led her to the bed and gave her the sedative Dr. Hillard had given me. Then I stopped by her bed until she slept and uh, tried to peer into the future. The future was not to be as we had imagined it. It was as though a mischievous fate were reminding us that uh, man proposes and God disposes. In the first place, David Killigrew did not get this St. Larniston living. Instead, uh, the Reverend Saint, uh, Reverend James Hempel with his wife and his three daughters came to the parsonage. David went sadly back to become a curate again, to shelve his dream of marriage and to share his life with his widowed mother. Gross. He said he must write to each other and uh, hope. Yet, uh, Mrs. Yeo and Belter were only really concerned, as were Bess and Kit, as to whether the Hempels would require their services. Meliora seemed to have grown up in those weeks. I suppose I did too, for we suddenly found that security had been swept away from us. Meliora took me to her bedroom where we could talk in peace. She looked grave. But her fear for her own future had at least superimposed itself on her grief for her father, and there was no time for mourning. Karen, sir, eh, she said to me, sit down. I've heard that my father has left so little <clears throat> that it'll be necessary for me to earn my living. Oh, I looked at her. She had lost weight and seemed frail in her black dress. She had put up her hair, which had somehow made her look helpless. I pictured her in some stately mansion, the governess, not quite one of the servants, and yet considered unfit to associate with the family. I shivered. Uh, what, a, uh, what a my own fate. Uh, the one thing I did believe, I should be more able to take care of myself than she would. What, uh, what do you propose I do? Uh, I asked. Well, I want to I wanna talk it over with you, because you see the effects you two. Uh, y y you'll have to leave here. Well, we shall have to find means of earning a living, and I shall talk it over with Granny. Karen, sir, I shan't like our being separated. Nor I. She smiled at me wanly. Uh, if we could be together somewhere. I wondered if we could start a school or, or something. Where? Uh, somewhere in St. Larnston. Uh, it's a, Lamston. It's a wild plan, and I could see that she didn't believe in it even as she spoke. Uh, uh, when should we have to leave? I asked. The Hemphills are coming in at the end of the month, and that gives us three weeks. Mrs. Hemphill uh, is very kind. And she has said that I need not worry if I want to stay a little bit longer. Uh, she won't expect to find me here. I could go to my granny, I suppose. Her face puckered as she turned away. Mm -hmm. I should have cried with her, and I felt that everything I had gained was being snatched from me. No, not everything. I had come to the parsonage, an ignorant girl. Now, I was a young woman, almost as educated as Meliora, and I could be a governess, even as she could. That thought gave me confidence and courage. I would talk to Granny. I wouldn't despair yet. Eh, a few days later, uh, Lady St. Lampson sent for Meliora, and I can only say sent in quotes, because uh, that was uh, not like the invitations Meliora had received previously. This was a command. Meliora put on her black coat and straw hat, and uh, Miss Kello, who was leaving at the end of the week, <coughs> drove her to the abbess. They returned in about an hour. Meliora went to her room, calling me to come to her. I've settled it, she cried. Well, I didn't understand her. And she went on quickly. Lady St. Lamston uh, has offered me a post, and I've accepted it. I'm to be her companion. At least uh, we won't have to go away. Uh, we... Well, you didn't think I'd leave you, she smiled, and like you've done in the old days. Oh, oh, I know it won't be like uh, it was much, but it, at least it's something definite. I'm to be her companion, and there's a job for you, too. Uh, what sort of job? Uh, lady's maid to Mrs. Justin St. Lamston. Lady's maid? Oh, Tess, 
Tess, Karensa, damn it, it's the word yes again, but they keep putting a T in here. I hate this book I bought. I paid like nine bucks for this book and it's horribly uh, copied over. You can do it. Uh, you have to look after her clothes, do her hair and make yourself generally useful. I don't think it'll be very difficult. And uh, you do like clothes. Uh, think how clever you were with the red velvet dress. I was too taken aback to speak. Well, I think it's probably a good place to stop. At page 155 out of 400. Ugh. Hell on earth. Uh, why don't we go down to the smoking room and uh, have a cigarette and uh, consider what the hell we just read. Well, there you go. <clears throat> why don't you um, just take a seat? Uh, I see you brought your book. Uh, why don't you just uh, enjoy my here, my smoking room, where my wife decided to put parakeets in cages, where they all get, where they all get lung cancer. Uh, oh God, that's a lot. That's a big burp. Um, uh, I'm really trying to push through this book. I'm trying to get done before uh, Hallow before Halloween comes, because. Um, Damn it, I want to read some kind of Halloween-y thing. But I'm trying to get through this book first. Uh, and this book is real, real long. It's not bad. It's written well. Uh, you get to learn the full story of Karensa. Uh, so this isn't like a bad thing. But for a person with a podcast that they record in their basement slash whole mansion. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, it's uh, a big pain in the butt because you just want things to be a lot more short. Uh, and I guess that's probably part of the problem when you read public domain books is that they're long as hell because everyone that wrote it loved to read their own writing, I guess. Um, anyways, uh, I like to think that someday in the far, far future, alien archaeologists will come back to Earth and find uh, a bunch of hard drives or floppy disks with my podcasts on him and say, oh, wow, he made real long episodes that no one's ever going to listen to. Anyone who sees my a new episode came up from Glenn. Oh, well, it's just, God damn it. It's like two and a half hours long. I'm not listening to that. Uh, that's But then they, the archaeologists from uh, Spain, Mars, will suddenly, oh, what a good guy. What a good, good guy. He took the time to uh, put this book, no matter how long it took, uh, onto a podcast. Thank God for these floppy disks that he buried in his backyard before he died. Um, what do we, uh, what do we learn? Uh, Karen, sir, uh, gets to finally go to a ball. Uh, it turns out that Meliora's dad is too sick. The guy just keeps getting yellower and yellower. Like, uh, when you urinate into a jar, and leave it in the sun, and it ambers into a dark gold. Uh, and so then the, she gets to go, uh, Karensa, and so then she goes, and she puts on a mask, uh, she gets to dance and have a good time, uh, one of the rich kids gets, uh, sexually aggressive towards her, and, uh, it kind of winds up, she almost gets locked in this castle, so that's kind of the first time we get a little hint of this, uh, big giant home being a problem, uh, and then, uh, then she escapes and, and gets to crush on Kim, and, uh, then, uh, the dad finally dies, and Meliora's all upset. Turns out the dad's got no money. As far as a rich person in the neighborhood goes, uh, he wasn't that rich. So, uh, which is fine. Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, Meliora's now on her own. Now she's the slave girl. She's got to be a companion to a rich person, which has got to be the most deflating thing on the face of the earth. Just uh, entertain me. I'm wealthy and I have no friends. And now I'm hiring you to be my friend. Much like Meliora did to Carissa. Um... And then that's kind of it. So that's where we leave off. The story still feels like it's barely starting, and we're like 200 pages in. So that's depressing. Uh, this is going to go on forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. But either way, uh, I'm going to keep reading uh, to you because you keep coming here all the time. And so uh, uh, I guess there's nothing to say that we've learned from this except that rich people are a sad people. And uh, poor people uh, feed off the sadness of the rich. And that's uh, nothing about that change today. So with that, uh, I guess I'll see you next week. Uh, thanks for listening.
Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, nah, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com, which uh, just points you to my link tree. Everything's on the link tree. Just go to the link tree if you want to see where I am. And of course, uh, link tree has the dumbest URL in the world. L-I-N-K dot... No, wait. L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash nuzzlehouse. It's the dumbest thing. If you go to nuzzlehouse.com, it's just going to reroute you over there. After giving you some weird error about it not being secure. I hate it. I hate the internet. But uh, if you go there, you get to hear some of the other stuff that uh, I and my wife work on. Like uh, the Radio Mystery Theater show, where we try to recreate uh, the same show that used to be on in the 70s, but they don't make any episodes anymore. So we make our own, and we just steal all their commercials. Uh, And also, just in the curious mind, uh, we made a Christmas album. If you go to our link tree, you can see that we made a Christmas album. It's the first thing we did after getting married, which I think everyone should do when they get married, is start talking about the Christmas album they're going to make. And we're working on a new show where we give relationship advice by reading a paranormal smut. And since uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com but don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left. <laughs>